Now at 14, you might be thinking offensive tackle. Well, I'm not so sure that Penny Sewell, Rashawn Slater, or Christian Darisaw, the top three tackles in this draft, will be available to Minnesota at 14. So unless you want to trade up, I don't think that you will be getting someone of that caliber. Someone like Elijah Vera Tucker, potentially, the tackle guard from USC who played some tackle in college but projects more as a guard in the NFL, could very easily be available to the Vikings at 14. But will Spielman consider that a reach for a player he might be able to get in a later round? Only time will tell. I want to mock! Mock! Courtney Cronin, little, little little offensive line speculation there uh, like on it. ESPN. All right, uh, can you pod that down a little bit, Dex? There, sorry, a little te- technical technical issues. Pod you, pod you down. The, the, or pod the phone. Down? The, I think Got the it? phone. Okay. We'll bring Randy right. in in a second. Look at Mac- you being high maintenance, Mackie and Mackie <laughs> and Judd here. Uh, it's draft week. We are two days away from the National Football League draft and the Vikings changing their franchise forever with, I don't know, an offensive lineman that may or may not flame out. A running back and linebacker (laughs) with their two top ten picks they're going to get. So, boys, we'll get to talking twins. We have a lot of gripes off of, I don't know what Rocco was thinking yesterday. I don't even know if Rocco knows what Rocco was thinking. Uh, The Wolves beat the Jazz last night for the, what, third time this season? (laughs) Yes, but the we're going to start with the filet mignon of today's show. Maybe even the filet mignon of all of our shows so far this year, because our friend Randy in Cottage Grove, Randy Vikes sixty nine on Twitter, who's a very prolific mock drafter, mind you, he has correctly predicted two of the last three Vikings first round picks. He nailed Mike Hughes. He nailed Justin Jefferson, and he has been a he's he's his health is fine apparently. Uh, he trailed off after explaining getting three vaccines for COVID, all three of the vaccines, which is not recommended by doctors. Uh, he has called in, and we're going to bring him in in just a second for his seven-round Vikings mock draft presented by our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. Uh, Federated's been around for over 100 years, based in Owatonna. They're one of us. They are Minnesota sports fans, for better or worse, and they've been giving peace of mind and uh, resources for risk management and protection to business owners for a long, long time. That's a partnership that you're going to want to maximize your business. Federatedinsurance.com. Find out more about MyShield, which is a trusted resource. And remember, at Federated, it's our business to protect yours. Is he alive? Randy Vikes, 69. Is he alive? Hello, Randy. Uh, Yeah, it's Randy. Hi, Randy. It's Uh, us. I'm fine. Good. I'm fine. Uh, you had a you know sort of a, a, scare, a scare as they say with uh, too many of the the vaccines, but I'm good now. That what they're saying now is, if anything, I'm just you know triple covered, so it's it's, it's good. <laughs> triple mm. covered, I like that. So did did you end up in the hospital that day, or just to go back on that? No, what I, what I, happened? I uh, woke up on the uh, just on the floor of my truck, Jesus. but I I woke up and kind of felt such dizzy. And then uh, wo- a little woozy, uh, and then I, I uh, called the nurse hotline and uh, told them what happened, and they said I should come in, and I just decided to sleep it off. Oh, so the, the nurse wait, so, 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 hotline. <laughs> the nur- I don't even want to know. I feel like that's not the first time you've called the nurse hotline, yeah. am I right? Yeah. <laughs> well, different sorts of hotlines, but uh, this is a medical one, and they give good advice. What's your, hotline, uh, what's your hotline stud stable? It's personal, uh, Jeff. It's personal, but I I, I do I do uh, I, you know the Alina is good. Uh, they're always give good friendly advice. I'm just glad you're okay. Yeah, I'm glad you're. Too. We're all glad that you're okay, Randy. Yep, yeah, I uh, got right back at you. Good. Well, they give you this little card that says I got uh, you know here's my name you know and I got my vaccine, but I had three other cards obviously. And uh, so I decided to just uh, eat them. I ate them. What? I put put them in a uh, blender with a smoothie, and they're gone now. Uh, so you know that's the the good thing is that people say, "Where's your vaccine card?" It's literally in me now. So that's <laughs> it's, so just, it's just inside you. All right. Well, actually, probably science says it's not inside you anymore, but that's really beside the point. It's more of a, 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 a sort of a ceremonial, uh, mm-hmm. sort of like people burn a jersey. 
uh, and this is, uh, in my case, just wanted to make it official. All three were good, and I'm right back in, in uh, my uh, top tip-top mocking form. And I actually put uh, some of the dating on hold to be able to focus on this, and I'm real, real excited to bring it to you guys. And as you know, I'm going to do all every pick for every team, all seven rounds. Um, well, I, I, I just, I just, want, I just want to make sure that we set some ground rules off the top here, just for some of it's for time constraint reasons. Um, you know, we know that you're a prolific mock drafter and you've put a ton of research into this thing. We don't have time for the full every team seven round mock draft. So, so just the, the ground well, that's rules. How that, the story shapes up. How do you? How are you supposed to learn the story of the every draft is like a storybook. You don't know how it unfolds till you start to see how it unfolds. And listen, so. we don't dispute that. We just want the footnotes, okay? You can tell the yeah. whole story on your website or your your Twitter account, wherever. Well, but just we just we, we we just want the Vikings picks for for all the round. I think they have ten picks right now. Uh, we would we would appreciate it's if you would keep more the. Than that. We're going to get more than that. There's trades in here and everything. Okay, well that brings me to ground rule number two, which is we would prefer no trades. Okay, just no trades and brief descriptions of players to keep it moving. Well, that I mean, it, that jacks up the whole thing. I mean, my 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 round one guy is that we we trade back and and, and now now he's going to seem like a reach. Okay, well if you get it, okay, well just pick him at fourteen, and if you get it right, we're still going to give you credit. <laughs> Well, he's, yeah. he's he's a stud, but I I, I don't know if they're going to take that. All right, I'll, okay. You, now you're putting sponsors on my thing. I heard. I thought I couldn't do that. Well, you no, no we can. It's our can. show. We yeah. can do that. Yeah, and you tried to do that last time, and it got bad. I did do it, and then you hosed it, and they didn't they didn't come through. Yeah. So, well. Okay. Fine. I'll, I'll just. I guess I'll just do the Vikes. It, uh, and no trades, huh? All right. This is the whole. Th- this wasn't the bill of goods I was sold. But who'd you talk to? To Jeff, I first of all, okay. there is no Jeff on this <laughs> no, show. There's no Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, right. here we go. Okay, uh, this is Randy and Cottage Grove's seven round, well, six round, right? Vikings mock draft, 2021. Let's fire it up. Well, in uh, round one, uh, I guess we're going to take him at 14 because I can't tell you where we're really going to take him. Uh, so at uh, now, round one, we're going to go ahead and uh, take Tevin Jenkins, uh, offensive tackle of Oklahoma State. Ooh. He's, he's kind of a reach at 14, but it, if you read between the lines, that ain't where we're going to take him, but I guess that's where we're taking him according to these bozos, so that's fine. So you've got to trade uh, down. You've got to trade down for well, Tevin Jenkins, that. yeah? Maybe not. Maybe that didn't happen, so that's fine. Uh well, hold on. This is this, this is very interesting. I mean, whether they take him at fourteen or whether they trade back, I don't know that we've seen many mocks with Tevin Jenkins going to the Vikings in the first round. Uh, but Pro Football Focus has him as one of the handful of best tackles, a first round grade tackle. He's a stud. So, Judd and Daglin, what are your thoughts on Tevin Jenkins' offensive tackle? My curiosity is this. Is is this the pick that you were so close to revealing to us a few weeks back? When you realized that you had such a great idea that you were going to call Rick first and then tell us, Randy. I know. I, I pivoted off of that idea. Can you tell us what that was now? It was a QB. I'll leave it at that. Oh. Did, you ever, did you ever get a hold of Rick? No. No, he doesn't uh, He doesn't return <laughs> the email. Oh. Did you try calling? Not anymore. He used to. I used to. He used to be more cordial, but I guess he's busy. Anywho, Tevin Jenkins is going to be the pick in round one, and, and it, it ain't going to happen to 14, but that's fine. Uh, let's go to 78. I guess I'll just go slot for all these picks. No trades. Okay, fine. No, we would appreciate uh, that. Okay. Another lineman, 78, really going to fortify, and this is going to be Quinn, uh, Quinn Manners from uh, Whitewater. This is a school that, that Wisconsin Whitewater doesn't get its due. A lot of people give, like to give NDSU its its uh, its due. Uh, th- this is a school that, that that kicks out some studs, and uh, you know Quinn Miners is uh, he's he's going to look good in purple, and he's he's a versatile lineman, uh, and and he's not a reach at seventy eight. In fact, he's a value. Do you scout the school, Randy? Why, I've, been to, I've been to some games of theirs, sure. 
Just seems. I mean, yeah. I mean, I get that he's, find a, he's a prospect, talent. but like Wisconsin Whitewater. I mean, what kind of teams are you really playing? Are you can just you're going to go from Whitewater to the NFC he's North. He's going to play on Sundays. He's going to play on Sundays. Third round seems high, Randy. I'm I, not going to lie to you right I, now. I've heard they're like the Alabama Crimson Tide of, of D3 football. Well, you know, here's they're... the problem. In oh, my, in my way, my mock falls. We get a second rounder back, but you, you're not letting me do that. So here we are in the third. We're taking minors. Now we go to ninety. And uh, Zim's going to get a new toy, as they say. Uh, Janarius Robinson, uh, Florida State, he, he can really fly off the edge. And he's going to be a fun bookend there for uh, Daniel Hunter. Uh, Janarius Robinson is, is, is a great value at 90. I love that pick. 119 now. There are a lot of different ways we could go at buck 19, but I really like Tyler Shevlin. Uh, Tyler Shevlin, LSU. He's, a, he's an in D line, you know, inside D line guy who can move around a little bit. Uh, if you watch a lot of LSU games, you know, Shevlin kind of goes uh, a little bit under the radar, but he is a stud, and he is—he's someone who might seem like a little bit of a reach at 119, but but he'll he'll work out. He definitely will. Uh, buck buck 25 now. A lot of meat and potatoes here. I think that's that's four linemen that you've drafted so far here in the first four picks. So. We should. We yeah, should. No, I think we should have some fewer problems with the happens. offensive and defensive line now. That's where football happens. Uh, is in the trenches. He is right. Uh, you you move, if you don't move, I don't care if you're you're you know a, a Pat Pat Mahomes or, or or what. If you if you don't, if you can't move bodies. You can't move the rock. And I mean, there's just watch. I like how you're thinking. The guy who does the reviews, Baldy. He knows it all starts and ends right there. I agree, Baldy. I don't know why Baldy isn't just the Vikings' assistant GM now. The George Payton. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a stud. Oh yeah, big time stud. Yeah. Okay, you want me to move off the line? Here you go. This is what you get now. Okay, now you're going to get a cornerback at 125. Israel Makabu from South Carolina. Mm. This kid has got an absolute rotational bubble. He can move left. He can move right. He can cover people even once he blows coverage because he's just got a body that can get up and twist. Israel Makamu is going to be a guy who put a little insurance in that secondary for him. It might might be good, especially with what's going on with uh, with uh, Gladney. Hmm. All right. And then so what did you say? Board. He can he can really move and twist. Is he does he? He's got good space. He's spa- he he can do stuff in the air. He can move around in the air. It's important. Move around Superman. in the air. Yeah, Superman like just jump up. This ain't basketball. You don't jump up. You got to jump, and you got to like uh, be able to have the wingspan to bust up plays. You know, what if you blew that coverage, and you still get a finger on the ball. Sounds like a you Marvel know, superhero. That. I can't believe he's still available at pick one twenty five. Quite frankly, yeah, he's real McConnell, one twenty five. All right, uh, one thirty four. <laughs> this is another guy who, if he falls, just get. This is going to make Zim snug because there, this is going to be another yet another steal. Um, and this is T- Talona Hufanga. Uh, you guys know Talona Hufanga from USC. He's a he's, oh, yeah. a he's a safety that will fit very nicely into this system. He's versatile, you know. Uh, but Hufanga is a, a, he's he could start year one. I mean, he really could start year one. And you're getting him at at a value at 134. A lot of people want to say, you know, why why don't uh, why don't the Vikings take a QB? And you guys know I'm I'm down on because uh, uh, think you think he's he sucks. He's overpaid. He's a, he's a fake, kind of a fake guy. Well, mm-hmm. he's a guy who could be kind of that steal. You know, and they're, they're probably not going to get one of the top QBs, even though uh, Kellen Mound, who I love, is kind of climbing the charts. They're probably not going to overpay for him. But here's a guy under the radar. Keep an eye on Jamie Newman, QB from Georgia. Ooh. At 143, it would definitely be a, a good place to take a flyer on potential QB of the future there. Wow. If So if they drafted Jamie Newman, how many how many bad games from Kirk until you make that switch? Till I, till I make it one. <laughs> wow. Just week, just, just week Do, two. Week two and Jamie Newman. No, he's saying a preseason game. If Kirk struggles in that first preseason game, he's gone. <laughs> well, first of all, I already would have shipped his ass. Yeah. You know, I, I would have I made uh, Shanahan... An offer he can't refuse, but uh, they didn't do that. They, they decided to pony up even more cash to the to this bozo. But uh, you know he can go to Pizza Ranch and smile his little fake smile at, and 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 he, you know whatever. That's fine. But uh, the future is going to come sooner or later. And and Zim, you you ride in on that horse. You might be riding out on that same horse as far as as far as Cousins goes. Wow, so that's that's, that's awfully cryptic. Yeah, Randy's down on Zim and Kirk. 
Well, he, he hitches his wagon to that bozo. So <laughs> Newman could be the new guy. Who knows? Uh, right, but at 157, right. here's another another offensive toy. <laughs> and he's he's this guy's a this guy's a stud. If he's there at 157, take him and take him and don't look back. And and that's John Bates from Boise State, the tight end. Again, he plays on that blue turf. He'll have to get used to the green turf, but it's not a big adjustment. A lot of people say it is. It's not. Uh, John Bates at Boise State. You know, again, if he's there at 157, that's a that's a fine fine reach, a little bit of a reach. It could be him, could be Kenny Yeboah, but I went with Bates. What would the adjustment be, Randy, from the blue turf to the green turf? Just picking up the ball. The same with same with the baseball. You know, it's a batter's eye, same thing. You, you know, you're trying to pick up the ball. It's got a little bit different look. Yeah, Judge. Right. I mean, sometimes never the, really thought about the blue turf. The, the football contrasts better with the blue. Sometimes it's easier, it's easier mm. to see the. Why do you think Boise State's so good? They oh, can see the ball better right. than other teams. PCL like, right? Mm-hmm. Lots of home runs. Okay, exactly. I got gotcha. you. Thank yeah. you. You, you, take a, you take a peek at, uh, at at the turf. You know, mm-hmm. it kind of puts a little little bit of a different sheen on the on the rock. And one sixty eight, got to get a wide receiver at some point. They're going to do it at one sixty eight with Anthony Schwartz and Wapern. And, and, and Schwartz is the kind of guy who, you know, he's not, he's not going to dazzle you, but he's a great possession guy. He can definitely hold on to the ball, and that's something that, you know, we, we can't have the butterfingers happening. I mean, you just Listen, cannot. Randy, I mean, I, I don't know a lot about some of these guys, but is, isn't Anthony Schwartz one of the fastest players in the draft? Sure. But that's, that's, it doesn't matter if you're fast if you can't hold on to it. Right. You know, who's the guy we got who was fast who who, who couldn't hold on to it? Just want to make sure you've done all. You just make sure you've done all your film study. I just want to make. Just testing you. Just testing you. How much Auburn are you watching? I mean, more than you. It sounds like. Wow. Oh, you've you've managed to oh tick him off like three times, oh Phil. No, no, I mean, Why are you pushing he's him? Not a razzle dazzle guy. He's full of vaccines and, <laughs> and vaccine cards. No, Randy, keep going. I apologize for my partner. All right, one ninety nine, and this is again. Ugh, all these picks are goofy now because you wouldn't let me do the trades, and so Schwartz is the pick there. All right, fine. And then one ninety nine, uh, another linebacker, just just a guy to throw into the mix, Ernest Jones from South Carolina. He's he's decent, you know. He he, he take a flyer on him. Fine. I don't know. the whole draft. This is not how I wanted to go down, but maybe maybe it'll be fine. So I I think well, first of all. Amazing job, Randy. Just all the research that you just put in there. Um, congratulations on pulling through here. Hours. How many hours? 2,000. 2,000 hours in one in this year? When did you start? You, 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 I, I'm at home with, with the, the uh, COVID. So, I, you know, we everybody had to be at home. What else are you going to do? Randy, I mean, that, that's an average of five and a half hours a day if you if you worked on the mock draft for seven days a week all year. Oh. It's a full-time job. Yeah, it is. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's mostly a labor of love unless you, you know, get uh, a sponsor, in which case you'd really like to kind of come through for them. Speaking of which. Yeah, uh, that's unfortunate that didn't happen. PXG Minneapolis is your absolute beacon if you're a golf fan mm. here. It's a golfer's paradise. The new Gen 4 golf clubs have landed, and this mock draft by Randy and Cottage Grove is powered by the Gen 4 drivers, fairways, hybrids, and irons. They also have all kinds of great swag. Spring and summer apparel has just arrived in store. Find it all at PXG Minneapolis in Southdale Center and find out more at pxg.com slash Minneapolis. Again, Randy and Cottage Grove's mock draft, seven rounds of Vikings draft picks, is brought to you by PXG Minneapolis. It's got a sponsor. Okay, well, that's two then, so here goes. Uh, Thank you for listening to uh, my mock draft. Uh, if you're ever in the East Metro uh, area and looking for a delicious uh, way to get a meal, a hot meal, and, uh, and good beverages, uh, check out the Five Eight Club. Oh, uh, they're, they're on. Uh, Wait, located, you can't do this. Uh, are they uh, paying you, or you, you no, just like Mid- the Five Eight Club? Located, uh, <laughs> you me, can't. The Five Five Eight Club is a family-owned business located on McKnight Road, yep. uh, and just north of Highway Ninety Four. <laughs> With delicious juicy Lucy's and just specials on craft beer, shots, and pool tabs. Yeah. Please visit Five Eight Club at either location 
and learn more on their website at www.58club.com. That, oh. oh. Is he, he's gone. He Dang just, it. He just I don't think he could do oh, that. that. Like, I think we're going to have a problem there. That was a, that no, I don't was a think staple. He, I don't think he's getting paid. I think he just likes the 5 8 club. Th- that just, was. <laughs> I, I think we got to find out because he sounded like a guy who might be getting paid. That, that was, was pretty a good read. Staple at the golf fan. I grew up two miles from there. We were there twice a week growing up. It's like it's a great it's a great spot. Oh, you it's know, fantastic! Can they throw some that cash? Exact spot. I got to tell you guys, Juicy Lucy's. No, they're yep overrated. Yep, I agree. Just I'll, I'll just take the cheese right on top of the burger. I don't want it to burn my tongue. You know what? I love those places. This. I loved them as a kid because of the novelty. Yeah. And now it's like, it's fine. Yeah, it's like but stuffed I mean, crust I'm, pizza, right? Like, oh, yeah. cool. there's cheese well, in the crust. It's like, uh, eh, this, uh, Here's my thing, thing, too. Thing, thing, thing crust is fine. I am not a deep dish pizza fan. It's what? the only pizza I'm not a fan of. Trash. What? I don't. What? Wait, I love pizza. You? I love pizza. Yeah, it's, it's not pizza. It's too much. It's not and pizza. And the cheese, spe- speaking of cheese... It's the coagulated cheese is it's not no it's not it's yeah. it's sort of gross. Yeah, it's like high. I'm not grossed out by much. I I think it's sort of gross. Wait, you think deep dish pizza is gross? It's one it's thing gross. to say you're not that yes. into it. Say it's gross? gross. Gross. I don't I don't want that much cheese at any one time. Like I like cheese, but like it's it's just too much. Have you? Are you talking about like the like? There's deep dish pizza that you get I'm at a Minnesota the sh- restaurant. I mean, like you go to you wait for an no, hour and a half sh- and get the real yeah, deal. No, that's what I want. Wow. Yeah, that's what I. It's too Lumal much. Lumal I'm, with, I'm, yes, with, Judd, I'm yeah. with Judd on this. It's it's trash. It's not good. I love pizza. I don't even but know you guys. Not, I don't even. It's know just who not. You are. It's not for me. Yeah, I agree. Rami Rami Makloff right now is running into the studio with these uh, with these. Oh hot God, takes he on got all slander. he got all mad last night. Well, because because all right, I will defend him Dan there. You guys and your love tweet. of ketchup is borderline unhealthy. On a hot dog, ketchup is the worst condiment with man. That and mayonnaise need to be blasted into the sun. If we got rid of those condiments, we'd be a better place. We'd be a much better place in society. Ketchup <laughs> is a staple of life, and plus, it's on a hot dog. Like I could see, I can totally see the. Don't put ketchup on like a steak. That makes total sense to me. Okay, yeah, but, okay, yeah. Says but, this, but, this, but, this but fraud a hot right dog? here. I once went to a bar in yeah, St. Like Paul ketchup. with Judd after a show, and Judd ordered a chicken Caesar wrap and put a mm. glob of ketchup in. Oh, dipped, yeah. dipped a chicken Caesar wrap in. It ketchup. was great. Yeah, it was awesome. You've done it, I've, you've, you've done it twice. Then we saw it happen in. Florida uh, I did it in too. Florida too. Oh, I've done it all the time. Oh my! God. I so like gross. ketchup on as much as possible. Oh my god! <laughs> chicken Caesar. So the Caesar dressing and the ketchup. Yeah, it was great. It was it was delicious. It was absolutely delicious. I love how Judd's like, I, if it's just a hot dog we're talking about here. No, and but, I'm saying, but that, I, I'm but, a chicken sandwich too. But I can see, I can see the steak thing of you shouldn't put. A, I can see that. It doesn't bother me personally, but I can see that one. But a hot dog. I mean, R- Rami acts like hot dogs are special. They are special. They're, They're very special foods. Yes. Yeah. You know what they deserve? Ketchup on them. I, I, I'm okay with the ketchup on the hot dog. And hot dogs are sacred. Both things can be true. But it's just it's natural. Ugh. There are some things in life. That are natural. I won't get into them all. But there are some things in life that, that fit together. Coming up next on Mackie and Judd, is a hot dog a sandwich? 651 six, 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 six. No. We're going to win, 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 win. Watch me make a pitch and change. I've heard the mound visits and I have to take out burritos. How many times have we been out to see burritos? Mm. Wes Johnson came out once earlier, but I forgot. Hey. So what the hell happened on that? But I'd like to talk about it. Yeah, I do. We have a clip. clip. Do we have Rocco mm-hmm. talking about this? Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. So go. Rocco. Okay. I was. Uh, that that's on me, and I was locked in on something else uh, at the time. Um, I actually called down to the bullpen to get uh, Robles going, um, and uh, and yes, obviously not uh, not a great moment, uh, but obviously I'm I'm more concerned right now about you know everything that went on. In the game and and the result and uh, and what happened, and a little less so on that, but uh, but yeah, that, that's what happened. And by the way, I am doing fine. I am great here in <laughs> Cleveland. Nothing is going wrong. I am not being held against my will by my team. Okay, he, I'm just going to ask the question. It's a question that I think uh, I think it's an uncomfortable question that the three of us feel obligated to be the first ones to pose. All right. Not demanding mm-hmm. this, just asking this. If they lose a couple more games here, would they fire Rocco? Now, I think this is a very interesting question because something I, I think something's going on here way more than we know, okay? They're not just playing bad baseball. 
Phil and I, and Dex, is, Dex might be close by now, have watched probably thousands of big league games. I'm not talking about Legion Ball, Babe Ruth. I'm talking about big league games, okay? I don't remember ever seeing, and I might be forgetting, but I don't remember ever seeing a manager come out after the pitching coach and not realize that he has to take the pitcher out. I've never seen that before. Something, I think something's up here, and I don't know what, and I'm not going to to recklessly speculate because it's beyond the norm of sports speculation. Um, that being said, no, I don't think, Phil, that they would fire him, but this just continues to feel wrong. Something's off here, and I don't know what. Yeah, and I this is pure speculation, pure speculation. But in the last year, year and a half in our country, I think we've seen more tension than we've seen in a long, long time in terms of personal beliefs and science beliefs and even <laughs> just like there's a million different things that we disagree on, political, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And again, this is I am not getting any info on this. I'm, this is just me speculating. When you're already off to a rough start and a couple guys get hurt, and then your star defensive shortstop, and I'm not even going to get into the vaccination part. I'm just saying like the human nature part mm-hmm. makes a decision, and then everyone in the clubhouse is put at risk for COVID, and five or six guys are put on the injured list, and now you now you've got guys hurt, and you're scrambling to put together rosters, and um, it's chaos. I don't think. The coaches and the players all in harmony are just going to say, yeah, okay, whatever, things happen. I think there's tension. It feels like there's probably some tension, and it doesn't feel like there's this amazing chemistry that we saw with the Bomba squad a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I, th- I, think, I think the COVID stuff probably has worn on them more than just like the lack of having starting players on the field. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they can't overcome it, but I think it's been a huge underlying theme. It's whether it's just the routines being thrown off or the fact that the Twins now have to go through like an extra month of COVID protocols that other teams that have 85% vaccination rates. Like I I wouldn't dismiss this angle, I guess is what I'm saying to you guys. So there there's two things too off of this. One is Rocco's had a bad year and and he has made a lot of judgment calls that have backfired. And what makes baseball great is if those judgment calls are right, we praise you and say, man, Rocco Baldelli, the zen of Rocco. And if they don't go well, we rightfully so second guess and criticize. And he deserves he deserves heat for decisions that he has made. What happened last night with Barrios is not a second guess of a decision. It's a forgetfulness that doesn't happen in baseball. Like it, it's, it is a... It is a flat out mistake that is embarrassing. That can't, and he can say, I had my mind on other things. He can say whatever he wants. This is embarrassing. This is not a, why did you turn to Column A again? Which is a great discussion. And that's a second guess. This is a dude, if you're telling the truth, you forgot three batters before you came out. And my, cont- my feeling initially was, I wonder if Barrios told him to bleep off and he got sort of flustered and was like, okay, stay in. And then uh, the home, home plate ump said he can't stay in because it was just so weird. And so I, I am willing to go down the path that there's way more to th- that story than we know. But let me bring up something else that every time I have seen a team in sports deal with this, it's been a it's been a issue for that season. Okay, Phil? And we have not broached this yet. Um, and I am in no way, shape, or form saying that if this is a problem, it shouldn't be. That's the death of Mike Bell, okay? Yeah. Um, when Tony Sprano died, think about how that year went. And think about how Zimmer was. Mm-hmm. And, and think about how it sort of just all crumbled. Um, I covered so the first time I covered a team that had experienced a death was the Packers had a, a scout. I think his name was Mark Hatley, uh, and it was one of the two years I covered the Packers. I think it was two thousand four, and he was found dead in his bed of a heart attack right before that season. And they eventually m- made the playoffs, but they got off to a really rough start too. And my feeling is this. To succeed in pro sports, you need focus. Like, it's all-consuming. 
It's all consuming. It's why sports don't care about holidays. It's why they don't care about the norm because you are, and Phil, you, you've seen the same thing. These guys are hyper-focused on one thing and like the rest of life sort of gets shoved out, right? Like, you know, the family, things like that. For the course of the season, the most important thing, this might not be the best thing for people, but the most important thing is their team and their sport. And we haven't talked a lot about the death of Mike Bell, but the death of Mike Bell was very sudden. He was Rocco's bench coach. Because we didn't get to go in the clubhouse last year, I have no idea if guys loved him or what, but I can tell you, having been in the clubhouse two years before, you know, Derek Shelton was in Rocco's office and was like Rocco's confident, mm-hmm. confidant constantly. All I'm saying is this seems to go beyond the norm of a slump or just a team that's like scuffling. And look, I think when you introduce death into a group of people who are young, young men who are athletes, who probably think about death never, and now this guy's just gone. Like, yeah. it didn't take months. He's just gone. I think that can't be dismissed. And it would not surprise me if Baldelli is is also really struggling here. Because I will say this. I don't think the way that he acts and talks is an act. I think he's a very sensitive guy. Like, I think he's a very, I think he's very much in tune with how people are feeling. And if he and, if he and Mike Bell were super tight, I don't think that can be dismissed. Yeah, it's it's a really really interesting point, and the Sperano example is a great one. And that the Vikings, the the sudden nature of it, and and the the impact and the effect that he had, and the respect that he commanded, guys loved Tony Sperano. He was he was I mean he coached hard, but that Vikings team mentally, emotionally was never the same. I mean, were they thinking about it every waking second? Like it's the fourth quarter, and they allow a big drive defensively or they don't get a first down offensively is like, is everything directly tied to Tony Sperano's absence? No, but it was definitely something that they had a hard time dealing with. And a lot of guys would tell you it took the juice out of the season. Like it just, it was, it was hard to be as enthusiastic and engaged and top of the step, so to speak. Right. When you just lost someone that was a huge part of everyone's lives and, like you, I don't have a ton of information because, you know, just the, the, the closed off nature of how the twins have had to operate the last couple of years. But that dude was part of their daily operation for a long time and built some relationships. And you don't just shrug your shoulders and get over it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so whether it's that, whether it's the, the COVID tear through the clubhouse and the injuries and now the slow start and blowing some games late. It just feels like there's a heavy weight on this team right now. And some of these excuses or reasons are valid, right? I mean, there's there's been a couple that I turned my head sideways at. Like yesterday, Dan Hayes from The Athletic mentioned on Twitter that the Twins have only had batting practice before games like four times all season because they only take batting practice before night games. Well, you know, not to pull it back in my day, I told Declan this on the Score North uh, Instagram Live Emergency Twins gripe session yesterday. But I covered the Twins beat from 2010 through 2013. Covered plenty of day games. Like, did they have a lot of day games where they didn't take batting practice? Of course. Did they take batting practice before day games sometimes? Yes. It's not illegal. <laughs> like, if your offense isn't going, you can't just stick to this mantra that while well, we we let our guys rest before day games, they can sleep in a little bit longer or whatever. And they, you know, d- you know, day games are for preserving energy as much as you can going into the actual game itself well if your offense isn't clicking maybe once a week during a day game you should take some pregame batting practice like so there's 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 reasons that make sense that are hard to overcome and then there's some other things like putting Alex Colome in close games still when he's clearly not right that are fixable and don't make sense and all of it adds up to one of the worst starts in recent franchise history this is a worse start than the 2011 twins had that team, I think, through 21 games was like 9-12, and 12, I want to say. So mm-hmm. this is a worse start than that. I don't think they're out of it yet, but the, if, they, if they lose, like, they're to the point now where if they lose, like, two more games, it's just straight over. It's going to be almost impossible to come back from 10 games below 500 this early in the season. So, two, yeah. Two things, too. Also, their record in 2016 was identical to this, too. They were 7-14 and 14 when they went on to lose 101 baseball games in 2016. And to your point about Mike Bell, I was watching the Cleveland broadcast yesterday, and I don't know if this was said to on on Bally Sports North, 
but the Cleveland broadcaster basically alluded to the point when Baldelli screwed up the mound visit that said, this is where your bench coach comes in handy. They, like, they pretty much flat out said, if you had a bench coach who was your right-hand man, this is where that would be a situation because he essentially forgot the mound visits. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, they were subtle about it because obviously Mike Bell's passing. I don't, and they they promoted someone, right? They promoted yeah, someone to his did. role. So there is someone there. It's yeah. not like the job is completely vacant. But they, they basically said the same thing we're saying where that's where a guy like Mike Bell would have stepped in and probably have prevented that situation from happening. This entire team to me feels like it's not focused. And I don't know why. Like it just it just feels like there there's a lack of general focus on a daily basis and they can't get it. And my question is why? And I'm just I'm spitballing here as to if you can't if if you need to be as focused as possible, which a baseball team does, and you can't, why not? Yeah. Uh, another layer to add on top of this, it's it's so hard to quantify, but Byron Buxton is now out with a knee injury, and they're saying it's something that's been plaguing him all season. I believe it's patella tendinitis is what yeah, they're which is classifying the kneecap, it as. right? Yeah, and it just flares up sometimes, and other people yeah. who've had it, I've heard say, you know, sometimes you just have a bad day with it, and then it goes back down. Now, he still is performing at a ridiculously high level, so if he's been playing through it, it hasn't impacted him too much. But I think it, it broaches the question with the hamstrings that we've seen and the foot, and not just with him, with the whole team so far this year, and now the knee, and they've had guys just sit out because they're not feeling good or whatever, upper respiratory or stomach ailments. And Again, I'm just posing questions. Are the Twins one of the unluckiest teams ever through the first three weeks of a season where they just have all these ailments that are knocking guys out for stretches? Sano, Donaldson, Buxton, Arise missed a game because he was feeling sick, et cetera, right? And COVID, et cetera. Um, or are they just like, now with COVID, you can't play through. You're put on a list. but Or do they just err so far on the side of never playing through discomfort that as soon as a guy has any sort of sore blank or my stomach is feeling this way that it's just automatic that you don't play that day Um, I don't know the answer but it seems like they miss a lot of games for a lot of things yeah and the Buxton thing to me though is just it's its own special category of it's always something and I don't even to go back I don't even blame him so I am not saying he's soft I have no idea okay Uh, he certainly seems like a guy who's wired right so my inclination would be to say he's not soft, but it is always something when it comes to Buxton. And, like, you can never – you literally now can't go a month with saying, you know what, he's just going to play. It's going to to be fine. Uh, and as much as Patrick jokes about it, yes, I think the Twins err too far on the side of caution at times. They for sure do. Uh, but that being said, you know, with Byron – this is this is why you needed and, and Phil. I think that you advocated for this a year ago, and I certainly did this past spring. This is why you needed to go sell a veteran, viable center fielder on being on your roster, signing him and saying Byron gets hurt a lot, and you can play some left field too. Like there's nothing wrong with with we signed a veteran guy. He can play. Center, when Buxton's out, and you know what? He can play left field, too, because he's going to go get baseballs. He's athletic. That's great. But this is why it. I really think if you wanted to contend, you need a person that you can plug in, and it can't be Jay Cave. It can't be Jay Cave. What sort of bugs me right now is, okay, it's a weird year, and guys do get hurt, and, and COVID's not new now, right? Were you really prepared Depth wise, and I'm not talking ha- having true starting Hall of Fame all star players, okay? But were you really prepared depth wise? Because it doesn't seem like it. Jake Cave is not. I mean, if if you if you sit down, if we had sat down in December, Phil, and started to go through the roster, and I said to you, okay, when it comes to Buxton, he's going to get hurt, and my answer to you is, but we got Jake Cave. What would you say to me? <laughs> Yeah, I would say I don't. I don't want Jake Cave uh, being tied after 21 games for like the fourth most played appearances on the yes, team. Yes, exactly. That's you know, what's happening right now. Ostadio, you know, okay, he could play lots of places. That's great. That's fine. He he is uh, potentially comic relief in the clubhouse for a long season. That's fine. But if Snow gets hurt, we're going to play him a ton. I would yeah. say no, no. That that's not no. That's not a that's not a championship caliber move. 
That is a that is a what the Pittsburgh Pirates do move. Yeah, and right I, now you're I, not you're not as good as the Pirates. Since we're airing our grievances here too, I wanted to pull this up as well. Uh, you were asking a couple weeks ago about pitch framing because you had a theory about Ryan oh, Jeffers. I got rants on this now too. And yeah, I'm I'm ahead. trying to decipher this on baseballsavant dot so baseballsavant dot com tracks catcher framing. And it looks like both Mitch Garver and Ryan Jeffers are right in the middle of the pack. They're not the worst, but they're not the best in terms of converting close pitches to strikes. You know, if those pitches that are or making right. sure that close pitches are called strikes if they're in the strike zone. Right. But there's been some there's there was two glaring ones for sure in that game yesterday where Ryan Jeffers is just like he he's framing a pitch like a junior high catcher would. Yeah. He's he's like moving his glove a half a foot, right? Instead of making a tweak, and I know you you texted us yesterday. There was I can't remember the one. It was like in this, I think there was a reliever in the game or something. But like little things like that, even that just stand out now, where you just need a little edge in a close game, and your catcher is framing a pitch incorrectly or something, and uh, and it goes against you. All right, I got a question for you because I might be wrong here. Like I I'm getting old. I might be forgetful now. But when pitch framing, pitch framing became a thing, which I think was, I think it became a real thing when you were covering the beat still, right? Like it became important mm -hmm. and, and trying to steal strikes and or i.e. just cheat. I felt like we used to, on the radio show, go through a list that you had of guys that could frame and that they, they were like the artistes of framing. Like, those guys knew how to subtly move the glove, right? Like, okay, pitch is a little bit outside, but I'm just going to move it back a little bit. And and we talked about, oh, my God, that's such a great attribute to to have, and, you know, there's guys that can do that. Is it just me, or has this become now jerking the ball around the zone, uh, to your point, like a high school kid would? Because I see, and it's not, it's, it's Jeffers, Garver, to a certain d degree, I do think he's a little bit more um, up to date on how to do it, adroit at how to do it. But do you feel like now we see more catchers literally jerk the ball around? And I think they cost their pitchers strikes because the subtlety was just to move slightly, and now it's like pitches outside, and you're and and you're taking it and you're bringing it like into a yeah. middle of the zone strike. Well, now and now umpires know that this is a thing more than ever. Like they've always known it's been a thing, but now there's like MLB's website has a, a stat page showing you. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Twins catchers compared to the twin, the two twins catchers, Jeffers and Garver, are both right around league average pitch framers this season so far. <laughs> um, but like umpires know that these catchers are going to school on trying to trick them. Now, this is all going to be obsolete in like three years if baseball comes to its senses and just puts an electronic strike zone right. in play. Then a catcher can sit back there with a cocktail with his leg out like Tony Pena used to, and uh, and he can let the ball hit him in the chest protector with no one on base, and it, it won't matter. The ball will have crossed where it will have crossed. Uh, but there's a, there's a couple zones with Jeffers, like when you get to the – to the inside corner, high and low, that he is really, really bad at converting those pitches. There's a couple others that he's actually really good and like way above average, more toward the bottom of the zone. But uh, top, like top of the zone, he's below average in a lot of ways. I think he's trying to take pitches and bring them down in a more uh, animated fashion. But um, yeah, it's definitely, a, it's definitely. It's a thing in baseball where you have to learn how to trick the umpire, but you can't be too obvious about it. And right. they know you're trying to trick them, too. So even if you frame something perfectly, it might be a reverse psychology thing. They're like, I don't know. Did you twitch your glove? And you don't, oh, and you don't need to frame every pitch. If it's a bad pitch, don't try and frame it. Because <laughs> you don't know. But I, I, yeah, I, I, think the key, I think the key used to be the subtlety of the frame is what the umps respected. And now it's like, eh, that pitch was a, a pitch out, but you, you brought it in the middle of the strike zone. So, yeah, sure, that's a strike. Uh, last gripe about the Twins, just quickly, okay? Derek Falvey, you came from Cleveland. You were supposed to find the pitchers or a pitcher like the last pitcher for the Indians last night who came over from Texas in the Kluber trade. That's the type of guy you're supposed to get here. The Kluber trade was considered not that great and because people didn't know who the players coming from Texas were. But that last pitcher that they used, you guys, through absolute gas was fantastic. 
That's what you want. Emmanuel uh, Clase, right? Or Classe, I, I Classe, right? Classe, Classe, Classe. Classe. Yeah. Emmanuel Classe. But yeah. I mean, that guy, that's pitcher. that's the definition of where you're like, I can find pitching. Yep. Yeah, he uh, he was yeah he was ridiculous, and you know I I do appreciate I I, I still think Alex Calame was a good signing, and eventually I think he's going to snap out of it, but he's already done so much damage, like he's already yeah. cost them like four games. So, and that and part of it's on them. If a guy's not right, you got to find a way to not. I mean, literally put anyone out there in that situation. Yeah. Was was Jorge Alcala available? Like who could you put out there in that spot? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their season is absolutely hanging in the balance. If it's not already over, like they and I don't think it is, but their season is in the balance these next handful of games. If I know that in 2011 they were 20 games under five, they were 17 and 37 after the first two months and brought it all the way back to five games under 500. They made a huge run. Yep. But then injuries and age and different things and their lack of pitching. This is a better roster, I think, than that one on paper. Yep. But you can't just bank on, all right, well, we'll get hot in July and August. Like Now now the Royals are five games up on you, and they might be a worse team, but guess what? We're a month into the season, and you got to make up ground on them and the White Sox and Cleveland. Yep, so, exactly. Anyhow, all right, that was sort of therapy. <laughs> Just to end the show on a happy note, the Minnesota Timberwolves are clearly on track to compete for the Western (laughs) Conference Championship next year. If you go by the rule that they are dominating the best team in the West, they've just they've just run out of time and schedule this year, boys. If they just had a couple (laughs) more months, oh, you're going with the runway argument. The runway argument. I love the runway argument. Last night, uh, D'Lo had one of his best games of the year. Last night, the Wolves. The Wolves. The Wolves gave like a. A 10-0 run up in the final couple minutes, and then and then they bared down and they won that game. But uh, Towns was excellent. Ant Edwards was mostly terrible offensively throughout the entire game, but he grabbed a bunch of rebounds. He was passing yes. the ball. He was yep. active. Declan's guy, Jaden McDaniels, hit a big three and played some great defense last oh, night. Swipe in the post at the end of the game. I mean, oh, that was game good. saving. Great play. I was texting with Gerson afterwards. Like, great pick, Gerson. Seriously, great pick. You told your time like that. Excuse me. He texted me. He actually texted me. And then we then and then we exchanged some pleasant. What, yeah. what did you think? What did you think, yeah. Dex? Yeah. So um yeah, I mean, you that up? was super fun. These last two games. Congratulations to the Timberwolves. Their first back to back wins since the first two games of the season. What an accomplishment. I think streamers and balloons fell from the top of Target Center at the end of that game last night. Hey, don't laugh. They used to. <laughs> for the, every win. <laughs> they the did Bulls for the, win. They did for 97. The they, they fell did. from the street. Yeah. Um, I think that we are going to spend a lot of time in, in the coming year now, once the 2021-22 season starts, talking about Chris Finch as well. Yeah. Like, I, I think they did. I think they got this right. Yeah, they, they very clearly look different and more organized and confident yes. on the court. And he's and, running so and he runs some very creative plays. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that last when D'Lo broke free for the go ahead basket with like ten seconds left or whatever. Yep. Some of that was luck and just a broken coverage by Utah, but also some of it's design, right? Actually, it's you just, know what? Key Sang had a great tweet about that and he contrasted another I think it was against Phoenix and that one. And and he did a side by side, and in both plays, the double team follows Towns, who goes to center court. Yeah, and so they're they're like we can't let Cat get the ball, and he and then uh, D- Delo takes off inside, and he's wide open. No, I mean it, it's a really good play. And somebody even if even if someone rotates over on Delo, there's a wide open shooter in the corner because yep, two exactly. guys went to cover Cat. So. So, all right, so at least the Wolves are fun. We got our Randy and Cottage Grove mock. And write it down, he's nailed two of the last three. Tevin Jenkins, offensive tackle, Oklahoma State, is who he's going with. And I haven't seen Tevin Jenkins mock to the Vikings very often, which actually makes me feel even better about Randy's mock, that maybe yeah. he's maybe he's onto something here. We'll I don't see. know if it makes me feel better. Cause I, I, don't, I, don't know where I've, I don't know if I've seen him on a big board near near the top 15 picks at all. That's not, is, where, that's not where Randy had him going. Well, Randy he trading ate back. his vaccination cards. That's all I want to talk about. What's your dedication to getting healthy? Hmm? Have you? Uh... My vaccination card's in my wallet. That's my dedication. <laughs> it's not in my stomach. 
Good talk today, boys. Write that down, predictions, tomorrow on Mackie and Judd. You can always find fresh episodes multiple days a week of Judd's Hockey Show on the Mackie and Judd podcast feed and the Score North MN YouTube channel. Click that subscribe button and spread the word about uh, your favorite Minnesota sports talking head trio here. See you guys tomorrow.